Hello guys, Winston here. Probably about three years ago, I inherited a big sheet of acrylic at work. It was probably a door or a cover for something, and it was all scratched up. The people at my office were going to just toss it out, so I took possession of it instead and brought it home. Because of its condition, I knew its options were limited, but there was one project I had on my mind that would be a perfect fit. A wood and acrylic LED light. You've probably seen a couple of these on YouTube already. Someone starts with some wood and some acrylic, puts them through a table saw, drills a big honkin' hole through the layers, and glues it all together with varying degrees of fit and finish. And they all look the same. Everyone cuts their wood and acrylic the exact same size. But I don't want to settle for the status quo and make a simple light cube that's been done to death. That would be hashtag basic. Also, I don't have a drill press, so there is that. My vision was to make a stacked wood and acrylic light with a sort of tiered look, kind of like a Japanese pagoda, and with subtle chamfers to give the geometry a little more character. And because I'm using a CNC, I can also carve features into my layers to help with alignment. The lid and base would be designed to accommodate a 1-inch dowel around which I would wrap an LED strip. I would figure out the routing of power cables on the fly later. From my Fusion model, I exported some G-code and got to work at my CNC. For my wood, I'm using oak, which isn't my favorite thing in the world to machine, but I am quite fond of its grain pattern because I feel like there's something retro and warm about it. I mean, I know a lot of woodworkers hate it because it reminds them of ugly, overused aesthetics from prior decades, and looking at my bathroom, I'm inclined to agree. But when you use wood in new ways and in novel designs, I think it actually looks kind of classy and even refreshing. I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a Chris Salamone complex that I have to enjoy simpler wood types, but I digress. Red oak. It machines like garbage because of its big pores and varying fiber density. The top surface usually gets all fuzzy and messed up, so to get around that, I whipped up some tool paths for a compression end mill, which allowed me to make layers for my lamp that required almost no cleanup. If you want to learn more about using a compression end mill versus a regular end mill, check out last week's video. Now, for all of my praise of compression end mills, they don't do a great job in shallow pockets. So when it came time to cut recesses that would seat my acrylic panels, I reached for a downcutting end mill. I use this in conjunction with a super basic MDF jig to swap in my oak squares quickly and repeatably. I made enough pieces for two lamps, then I ran them over my router table which had been set up with a barely protruding chamfering bit. For my acrylic, I started with a 9x9 inch square that I cut from the larger sheet. This stuff is about a quarter inch thick and cuts easily with a small circular saw. Assuming your battery is charged, of course. Now, the best way to cut acrylic on the CNC is to use a single flute end mill. This provides the most generously sized channels possible to evacuate plastic chips, which is important because recutting chips is a recipe for friction, which leads to melting and gumming of your cutter, and ultimately failed cuts and broken tools. Here, I'm using a Harvey Tool single flute cutter, part number 52508, which has recommended feeds and speeds posted online. Since I'm a big baby when it comes to trying new cutting parameters, I went with a conservative version of those feeds and speeds. Using Fusion 360's live updating toolpath fields as a guide, I crafted my cutting recipe. A spindle speed of 24,000 would be necessary to reach about 800 surface feet per minute using an eighth inch end mill. This seems high, especially since I've said in the past that I prefer using the Makita over the DeWalt because of its lower RPM capabilities in plastic, but SFM is directly proportional to diameter, so a quarter inch cutter would only require 12,000 RPM to hit the same velocity at the cutting edges. To achieve a suitable chip load, I picked a feed rate of 80 inches per minute. This puts me at about 3.3 thou per revolution. Harvey recommends almost 5, but because I'm using a consumer grade machine and I was probably going to undershoot my RPMs anyway, I felt that a chip load on the lower side would be okay. And what do you know, everything worked out great. The texture isn't perfect, but the walls were clear. If I had a finishing end mill, they would be even better. And of course, if I'd used a laser, things would be almost too easy. I tried sanding up to a thousand grit on one set of the acrylic pieces, but it felt too tedious and time consuming to do for both lamps. The improvement was just marginal. That being said, if you opt to flame polish after hitting a thousand grit, you'd probably have a near glass smooth surface. But a little frosting isn't a bad thing in this case, it'll help diffuse the light. To assemble my enclosure, I first glued my acrylic pieces into the recesses in my oak layers. I can align the oak from the outside, but I can't align the acrylic externally because it doesn't sit flush with the edges. Then I glued each layer pair together into one body. I use E6000 for this which dries clear, but it isn't as strong as epoxy would be. However, it is way more convenient to apply. One thing I didn't glue in at this time was the base. I still needed to integrate my lights and run power. 
The LED strips I'm using are from Amazon. They're meant for use as bias lights for monitors or TVs and they run off 5V USB power which makes them super convenient. I think warmer lights look better and if you're planning on using these to add a soft glow in your room at night, the color temperature is something you should definitely take into account. Of course, you could also just use multicolor RGB strips, but these are what I had on hand. I figured out what length of LED strip I needed for each light and wrapped them around my dowels. These strips come with 3M VHB foam tape on the back which makes them really easy to install. To run power, I'd repurpose some old USB cables. This way, I could use a power bank or an existing wall adapter to run my lights. Hashtag recycling. I sliced the plugs off the mobile device side of these cables and isolated the positive and negative wires. I drilled a hole through the sides of my oak bases, slightly larger in diameter than my cables. This was so I could use some heat shrink as a form of improvised strain relief for the cables. Inside, I soldered my positive and negative wires to the LED strip. And to keep my power cables from pulling out, I globbed on some glue on the inside where they exited the wood. Before the final glue up, I made sure everything still worked, then I affixed the base to the rest of the enclosure. To finish the piece, I used some Danish oil. This was super easy to wipe on, and I could do it in my garage without having to expose myself to the wacky weather situation that Northeast has been subjected to for the past few months. After it had dried overnight, I glued some feet onto my lights so they would be stable and secure on whatever surface I put them on. And that wrapped up my oak and acrylic lamp project. On camera, everything about them is clean and simple, and overall I am happy with this experiment. But if you look closer and I modify the exposure on my camera, you'll see a lot of room for improvement. First off, I definitely want to increase the diffusion of my LEDs. Even with my deliberately imperfect surface finish, each point of light is still clearly visible. This is mitigated by the fact that from higher angles, the overhanging oak layers obstruct line of sight to the diodes, leaving only a soft glow visible. But if you place this near eye level, you will see bright spots. If you know of a better off-the-shelf 5V light source that I could use, let me know. It doesn't need to be in a strip form, it could just be a single strong diode that gets placed at the top or bottom of the enclosure. Gripe number two is glue squeeze out. I placed a minimal bead of E6000 near the inside of my layers to bias squeeze out towards the middle. Any glue that escaped on the outside would be harder to clean up, but I was hoping that there wouldn't be any to begin with. Turns out, there was some, and if you look closely enough, you can see them on the inside. Again, not something you would notice from afar, but it still bugs me. When I revisit this project in a couple months, I'm going to add features to control squeeze out. By machining a small lip around the perimeter of my contact area, I can capture excess glue and leave the edges of my acrylic untouched. Other than those two points though, I'm really happy with how everything turned out. I got clean repeatable cuts in oak and acrylic, the geometry and form factor look as cool as I'd imagined, and the electrical part of the project went off without a hitch. I'm always reluctant to pull out my soldering iron, but this was a relatively painless project. I want to thank you all very much for watching and also say that I'll be headed to California in May. I'm doing a big old road trip terminating at Bay Area Maker Fair. If you have suggestions on places to go and things to see in LA, San Diego, or San Francisco, let me know in the comment section down below. Or if you want to meet up sometime and grab drinks, let me know as well. I'll see you guys in a week or two with another CNC related video.